In this episode, I'm joined by Erica Salmon Byrne, the new CEO of Ethosphere, to discuss the partnership between Ethosphere and Alpine Investors. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back again for another episode, and I'm more than thrilled to have with me back Erica Salmon Byrne. Uh, Erica was on the pod uh, a few weeks back to talk about the opening of registration at, for the application process for 2023 World's Most Ethical Company Awards. But it turns out there's even some more exciting news <laughs> that came out, and I asked if she could come on and tell us, and she graciously took some of her very busy time, and you'll find out why it's her very busy time now. So with that very discombobulated introduction, Erica, first of all, welcome. And all I can say is congratulations, double. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Really appreciate that. I'm I'm excited to be with you. I'm excited for what our news means for the ethics and compliance community that we both love so much and what we are going to be able to do with this next chapter of Ethosphere. So maybe we should start with the next chapter of Ethosphere and reading from the title of the uh, press release, Ethosphere announces partnership with Alpine Investors to grow data-centered approach to ESG governments. There's probably about six podcasts just in that <laughs> title. So maybe you could break it down for us. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. So as you and I have talked about over the years, Tom, there has just been such a growth and such a hunger in our space for benchmarking data, for programmatic measurement opportunities. And Ethosphere has grown very organically over the course of the last 15 years. Um, trying to bring those solutions and those resources to the ethics and compliance community as a whole. And um, at the beginning of this year, we started to explore the possibility of taking on a partner who would be able to uh, help us accelerate that growth. And we started a whole process. It was a very long process. It, you know, that's a, it's a conversation for, for uh, over a drink of some kind in terms of just how long and involved that process was. But at the end of it, we really found what I think is going to be the best home for the business going forward. And that is as a part of the Alpine family. So for those of you on the line who don't know Alpine, um, it is a, a private equity firm based in San Francisco that bills itself as people-focused private equity. Um, that was particularly appealing to us here at Ethosphere because we think we have some of the most talented folks on the planet um, doing the work that we do. And so the idea we could partner with someone who was really going to invest in our people and our growth was very appealing. They're also a B Corp, so they're committed to um, doing things the right way to sustainability, to the kinds of initiatives that mean a lot to us. And they were particularly interested in partnering with us because they see a need to define the standards uh, in a amorphous ESG world where we're all trying to figure out what metrics really matter. Um, they saw an opportunity to invest there um, to start to define what standards matter, particularly on the S and the G. Uh, and we really think we've got a great opportunity to do that in partnership with them um, and that transaction closed at the end of September, and we launched the first week of October. So we are fresh into Ethosphere 3.0 um, and really doubling down on the way we collect data, how we use data, the technology that supports the data we use, and what that can mean for the community as a whole. So as part of that announcement, and um, well, actually, let me go back uh, to Alpine. Because mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly significant that they're a B Corp, yep. uh, obviously a people first philosophy. But could you tell us uh, your understanding what a B Corp certification is, why that was so important to Ethosphere, and really how all of us in the compliance community can use that information uh, simply about a B Corp certification going forward? Yeah. So um, a B Corp is basically a process that a company goes through to look at practices around diversity, equity and inclusion, sustainability, carbon footprint. Um, you know, a lot of the things that we think about when we think about this idea that we believe so strongly, which is that companies are a part of the communities in which they operate and they should think about their impact on their stakeholders writ large. And so it's a certification process that you go through, much like the certification process work that we do for ethics and compliance teams. Uh, and it really is emblematic of the commitment that Alpine has to being a people-focused PE firm, that they took the step of going through B Corp certification in the first place. So, um, you know, all of their practices would need to get examined, particularly as it pertains to the way they treat their people. Uh, and that was important to us because, you know, it's, it, PE 
um, has a has a reputation, right? Um, and the, these guys are really doing everything they can to do PE the right way. So to come to companies like ours with the resources, the support, the skills that PE brings, but without the sharp elbows. So thank you for saying that. So I didn't have to ask that question. Um, but the other thing that really impressed me, Erica, was the people first component of Alpine. I had the opportunity to look at that on their website. And frankly, they bring an entire approach, which many compliance practitioners will not simply be comfortable with, but will probably rejoice around because it's what we talk about in the ethics and compliance community uh, and have been for some time. So I was wondering if you could say a few words about your understanding of, of the people first approach. Yep, absolutely. So the thing that I love about people first, and we are admittedly in the very beginning stages of our participation in Alpine's people first process, but the thing that I really appreciate about people first, Tom, is it starts with the why, right? So the very first part of a people of, of Alpine's people first process is making sure that the company itself has really defined the, the core of its, of its purpose, right? Why does the company exist? Why does it get out of bed in the morning? What is the what is at the heart of its social license to operate? And then they cascade that people first, that, that purpose model, purpose-driven model down through the entire organization uh, using the one page process. So everybody at Ethisphere will have their version of our purpose statement as a business and what it means to their role in particular. And the idea behind it is, this is sort of Alpine's uh, animating th investing thesis, is that um, great people make great companies. And so, you know, the, the, really the, the part they're most prescriptive about from an investment perspective in terms of, you know, bringing you into the Alpine way of doing things is this people first process. This is the key, the, the core of what they do. And it's this idea that, if you invest in your people, if you empower your people, if you have all of your people pulling together behind the same purpose, great things will happen. And uh, and so we're, we're really excited about it. You know, I just had a flashback, I think to 2009, when I first met you guys, and I think you were with Corpedia. I was with Corpedia at the time, yep. Yep, and that's when I first got, uh, started going to conferences and met you guys. and. I mean, what a great journey. And this is not the end. This is just a part of the journey. Yeah. But for you in your journey from Corpedia to Ethisphere to now partnering with Alpine and to have a people first uh, approach to to all of that, I'm just I'm just stunned by that. Yeah, I, I, the thing that I love the most about it, Tom, is is it's it's such a symbol of where our space has turned out to be, right? I mean, if you had told the 2009 me at that, was that our second Global Ethics Summit? I think it was the, our second Global Ethics Summit that you were at. If you had told 2009 me that uh, that this would be the picture in 2022, I, I don't think I would have believed you at that point. Um, it, it, it would have seemed a little far-fetched, but, you know, it's really, I think, a, a, a symbol of where the, the space has gotten to, the importance of the work that we do, the work that our community does, um, that you have companies like Alpine looking at us and saying, hey, let's go make the world a better place. Absolutely. And let's make a profit while we're doing it. What's, right. What could be better than that? What could be better, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, before we move further into the corporate world, we have to talk about your new role. Uh, with Ethisphere and Andrew's new role. Yep. So I was wondering if you could talk about moving up to the CEO chair and then Andrew moving in and what that will mean uh, for you uh, going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Tim Arblick, who your listeners know very well as Ethisphere's long-term CEO, um, he has moved into a senior advisor role. So Tim's going to be advising the business and, and really focusing on those high-level conversations where um, – uh, he is working with customers to solve some of their thorniest problems. So he'll be working, uh, you know, sort of moving into that role. And the Alpine team has asked me to step up and serve as, as CEO. And I could not be more excited uh, to have the opportunity to do that. It's um, my primary responsibility, as the Alpine team has, has told me, is uh, chief proselytizer. So I will be spending a lot of time and energy 
talking about the why behind the work we do and the power of the data that we have and um, you know what it means to the business community as a whole, uh, especially I think Tom as as we move into some economically um, murkier waters, uh, helping to remind businesses as a whole of the value of a a strong compliance program, the business value of a strong compliance program. That's a a, a role that somebody really needs to fill, and and I'm delighted to be the one to to do so. So I'll be doing a lot of that. Um, my longtime colleague, Andrew Neblett, who was uh, at the Sears Chief Operating Officer, is moving into the president role, and he will be doing a lot of the technology oversight. So we are going to be investing heavily in the infrastructure that allows us to bring our data to the communities that we support. And Andrew's team is going to be doing a lot of that work. And then we have um, someone joining us from the Alpine side who is going to really be working on infrastructure projects. So. Um, you know, all the in the walls, uh, finance and HR work um, that, you know, was going to allow us to grow the way that we want to grow over the course of the next couple of years. I'm going to go back to the title of the press release, because as I said, I saw about six different uh, (laughs) podcasts in that, and it's grow data centered approach to ESG governance. And I'm going to focus not on the data, but on the ESG governance. I was on a podcast earlier and my guest said, It all flows from governance Mm -hmm. and everything flows from governance. And to have now the data centered approach to governance, I think really gives boards new power, uh, particularly around the ESG context. And if I could explain why I think that's so powerful, I see ESG as a business process. I see it as bringing together in a more holistic way, corporate topics and issues that have been certainly looked at and measured, but in a much more siloed manner. Yeah. I could never before hear, think about hearing of an environmental lawyer talking to a compliance professional, for instance. And there are other examples, but now we have someone, whether it's the head of sustainability, a chief compliance officer, or a board at the ESG level, looking at this holistically and now with data uh, to make those decisions, I think will only make businesses more efficient. But now we're moving into an area, a new area of governance. So I wanted to, it's a very long-winded way of introducing the question of the term ESG governance. What do you see in that? And why do you see governance as so critical at this juncture? I think govern- it's, a, it's a great question, Tom. And, and you know, I, I agree fundamentally with your characterization of most of the ESG work as really being business process, right? So, and part of the reason why I think this this is so important at this particular time is that there are so many companies out there that are trying to figure out what ESG means to them, right? And it's very easy to chase the ratings agencies and be like, oh, well, you know, so-and-so wants me to report on X, so I'll go report on X. And if you can't, if you can't step back and say, does X matter to us, then you're, you're really wasting a lot of effort in the, in the process. So what, when I think about ESG governance and particularly the data centered aspect of ESG governance, it's about stepping back and saying, these are the things that matter to us. And that formula is gonna be a little different depending on what kind of business you're in, right? Not every business is gonna care about all of the elements of the E or all the elements of the things that could be in the E. And so the governance piece of it is really about defining who your stakeholders are, understanding what what matters to those stakeholders, figuring out what you can track and not track, tracking those things well, and reporting on them holistically so that the people who are ingesting the information that's coming out from you understand what your goals are and how you're going to measure getting there. And tying those things back to the why, right? Because, again, it it is... um, if you don't have significant carbon footprint risk, then then why are you chasing reporting on carbon footprint risk when you could be spending your time reporting on modern slavery, or you could be spending your time reporting on DEI or something else that has so much more impact on your business, but you can't make that determination if you haven't figured out what matters to you in the first place. So really starting with that, what's our governing framework? Which of the, which of the agencies do we care about? because every one of them has a slightly different framework. If you look at MSCI's ESG categorization, it's different than BlackRock's. And so, you know, those are the kinds of things that that we're encouraging 
companies to think about and we think we can have a role to play. Well, I certainly think you have a role to play. I think we have a, all have a role to play and I can't wait to see the advocacy you will engage in as the future as an evangelist. So welcome yeah. to the evangelistic community. <laughs> but uh, the are there any uh, sort of specific initiatives you, you have in mind now or should we wait for further developments? No, so I think Probably, Tom, the thing that I'm most excited about that the team's working on right now is, um, you know, we, we are, we have heard loud and clear from the community that we serve that there are um, elements of program measurement that they would like to see better definition around. And so we're really working hard right now to categorize what those are. Um, figure out how to collect the information necessary and then match it in and connect it in with the information that we already have. So whether that is pulling in third party data sets into the other work that we do, adding in additional regulatory frameworks into our analysis, all of those pieces are things that, that I'm particularly excited about. We're going to be going on a big listening tour. Um, so we'll be you know, sitting down with a lot of customers uh, talking about our vision of the future and getting their input on what it looks like, um, and that it's going to be a lot of my work uh, over the course of November and December, along with other members of the team. So Tim, Andrew, and others, you know, we're going to be going uh, on, a, on a little bit of a roadshow um, and trying to figure out exactly what uh, the community needs from us um, and how we can we can potentially meet those needs, provided that it makes sense for us, right? That's the other thing, too, that I'm excited about is um, for a long time, Ethosphere has taken on any topic that is of interest to us. Um, and Alpine is going to push us to be uh, uh, tied to our mission and our purpose in a way that I think will really benefit us in the long run. You know, that last point is a great insight uh, coming from a law legal background where you took any work. Yep. Uh, then uh, for me, moving into compliance and trying to limit myself to that, it really allows you to focus on not simply what matters to you, but to focus on it in a much more robust way. Yeah. Uh, Erica, I am so excited for you. I'm so excited for Ethosphere. I can't wait to see what you guys have come up with over the past year or 18 months. Um, you've you've really brought in some top-notch people. Uh, obviously, I love Bill Coffin and what he's yeah. doing with all of that, uh, which I've really appreciated. And Andrew and, and his team have been great. So uh, I can't wait to see what you guys come up with. And I know we'll be continuing this conversation. For sure. Absolutely, Tom. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's a lot of fun to come on and celebrate this news with somebody like yourself who has really been there uh, since the beginning um, and, you know, understands how significant this is for all of us. So appreciate the time. Great. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. I hope you'll join me again next week where James Kukio is partner at Morrison and & Forster and fan favorite, returns to talk about the March 2022 Morrison & Forster Top 10 Anti-Corruption Developments.